Our interest in the Marshall's X-Craft started when the Lincoln branch of the Submariners Association decided to try and find some of the relatives of those that actually built the submarines. This was accomplished by writing an article which appeared in the Gainsborough Target and Lincolnshire Echo in January 2012. The responses to the article provided a considerable amount of information and experiences of Marshall's employees during the Second World War period. This presentation is the result of that investigation. We're not 100% sure why the Admiralty decided to manufacture midget submarines, but we suspect it was because at the time we did not have a weapon system that could penetrate the ring of protective steel that surrounded the German capital warships Tirpitz, Scharnhorst and others in the Norwegian fields. These vessels could be a significant threat to the Allied navies as they ventured out into the Atlantic or the North Sea. The X-Craft building programme commenced in 1942, when Varley Marine and HM Dockyard Portsmouth were commissioned by the Admiralty to construct two X-Craft prototypes, the X-3 and the X-4. It was to test the feasibility of the design. Now you may be wondering why the Admiralty started the class with X-3. What about X-1 and X-2? Well, both of these X-Craft numbers had been used before, for a different type of submarine. Following the building of X-3 and X-4, both were scrapped in 1945. Well, they were a success, and a full building programme commenced, as seen here. Firstly, X-5-class submarines, which we know as X-Craft. Apart from Vickers in Barrow and Broadbent at Huddersfield, Marshall Engineering of Gainsborough was initially tasked with building X-24 and X-25. Each submarine cost in the region of £30,000 to manufacture and was initially designed to accommodate three crew members. However, following trials of the prototype X-3 and X-4, the Admiralty realised that if one crew member got killed or injured during an operation, the two remaining crew members could not safely operate the submarine. They therefore added another seven feet to the original design so that the submarine could carry four crew members. The X-Craft were 51 feet 7 inches in length with an 8 foot 6 inch beam. The maximum diving depth was some 300 feet and they could do 6.5 knots surfaced and 4.5 knots submerged. The range of the submarine was 1300 nautical miles at 4 knots surfaced and 80 nautical miles at 2 knots dived. Their armament consisted of two 2 tonne Amatex chargers that were bolted to the side of the submarine and were designed to be jettisoned or laid beneath the target. The damage these two chargers could inflict was significant if placed in the right place and they could easily sink a capital warship. The second derivative or modified X-Craft were the XE-class submarines. The E in XE denoted that the submarine, having had a few modifications, was destined for operations in Far Eastern waters. Marshals of Gainsborough was also tasked to build XE-9. The modification made for these boats to operate in the Far East included increasing the length of the submarine by two feet to accommodate an air conditioning plant and a small refrigerator. They also, depending on the operation, could carry five crew members. There were also XT-class submarines. These submarines, again having been subjected to some modification, were destined to become training X-class submarines. Marshals of Gainsborough were also contracted to build XE-10 and XE-14-19. to Owing to the fact that the building of X-class submarines did not start until much later in the World War II period, a considerable number were cancelled. It's interesting to note that the majority of the cancelled X-Craft were due to be built by Marshals of Gainsborough. Perhaps this indicates that the Admiralty had considerable faith and respect for the Marshals engineering team 
and the fact that they produced a high quality product. But owing to the war coming to a successful conclusion, the majority of pre-ordered XE-class submarines had to be cancelled. This is a picture of Marshall's Yard in Gainsborough in the 1940s. There has been some debate concerning where in Marshall's Yard the submarines were built. Following considerable research, we've been assured that the submarines were built in Number 1 Yard, which is currently the site of Wilkinson and extended nearly to the Beaumont Street frontage. As I mentioned earlier, the submarines were designed to carry four men. The commanding officer, who was inevitably a lieutenant or lieutenant commander, the executive officer, a sub-lieutenant, an engine room artificer, normally a chief petty officer or petty officer, plus a diver who could be any rating. Here you can see one of the X-craft during its build at Marshalls. It's interesting to note that there was a resident naval officer at Marshalls, probably an engineer, throughout the build whose job was to oversee the build programme. There were several layers of security during the build programme. Firstly, an armed guard was stationed at the entrance to the building facility 24 hours a day. Secondly, all Marshall employees that were working on the boat were given a password, which probably changed daily at midnight. And thirdly, the submarine was partitioned off from the rest of the yard by a curtain. However, we've been reliably informed that every time a welder worked on the boat, you could see the outline of the submarine reflected upon the screen curtain from outside of the partitioned off area. So much for security. Whilst all the employees of Marshalls manufactured various parts for the submarine, they were not aware of what the part was for. Furthermore, the engineers during the final assembly stage of the submarine were required to sleep at Marshalls on makeshift bunks as another level of security. And that's similar to what still happens today. The crew joined the boat during the final build so that they could familiarise themselves with the systems and it was during this period that the crew named the boat. Admiralty only nominated class numbers for each submarine. However, on joining the submarine, the crews decided to unofficially name them. Marshall submarines were named Expeditious, the X-24, Exema, the X-25, and Unexpected, the XE-9. Let's return to this picture again, because we believe it contains a story. On completion of the build and acceptance by the Royal Navy overseer, and prior to moving the submarine, it was disguised as a very large motorboat. However, one of the problems that had to be solved was how to get the finished submarine out of the works in complete secrecy, as the rest of the factory was working shifts. One of the other problems was that on the pavement outside Marshall's main entrance stood an extra tall gas lamp of the type used to light the main road from Gainsborough Bridge and along Trinity and Beaumont Streets. As Beaumont Street was only about 30 feet wide overall, to manoeuvre a large object some 50 feet long through the door and swing it round for onward transportation was a difficult task, particularly as it had to be done in total darkness. To make it easier, the gas lamp was modified so that it could be lifted out of its socket by crane. The X-craft moved out and the lamp was replaced, so there was nothing to show that it had been moved. The modifications to the lamp were organised by the council's gas engineer, a Mr Derbyshire, but the surveyor's department was also involved. Following the removal of the X-craft from the factory, the road had to be inspected by the gas engineer and the surveyor's department to ensure that there were no visible clues left as to what had been happening. As to the route taken by the X-craft out of Gainsborough, Neither the gas engineer nor the surveyor's department knew any details. The Gainsborough Bridge could not possibly have stood the weight of the load, and unknown to most of the Gainsborough population, one of the bridge piers had been hollowed out right down to below the water level in case it had to be blown up in the advent of Germans invading. Furthermore, a significant number of holes had been bored in various approach roads to Gainsborough, 
so explosive charges could be placed. The only visible clues were small hydrant covers placed over the holes. Once the submarines were successfully removed from Marshall's building facility, they were towed on flatbed bogey trailer, probably by a Marshall's tractor, to their departure point. Of the three submarines that were built by Marshall's, two were transported via rail and another via the Trent on a barge. The crews travelled with the submarines. Unfortunately, when moving one of the completed submarines, a German bomber spotted the engineers moving the boat and machine gunned them. The engineers had to dive for cover in the gutter and luckily none of them were injured. The German bomber then went on to bomb Watson shipyard on the other side of the Trent and also bomb Ackland Street, unfortunately killing the school caretaker, a Mr Sutton. A bomb also landed in the post office on the corner of Ackland and Forster Streets but luckily did not explode. All submarines following completion were delivered to Scotland to form the 12th Submarine Flotilla. This was a long and slow journey in the 1940s, and the train and crew had to stop overnight. We're not sure if it's true, but we understand that the crew on stopping overnight managed to get the driver and the guard so drunk that it took them twice the time to get to their destination, and that questions were inevitably asked of the crew by the captain of the 12th Submarine Flotilla on arrival. This is a pre-war picture of the Kyle of Butte Hydro Hotel, which was taken over by the Navy during the Second World War and renamed HMS Varble I. This became the happy headquarters of the 12th Submarine Flotilla, the X-Craft, which was close to Loch Striven, where the submarines conducted the majority of the workup and training preparations. In addition to the loss of a significant number of crew members during operations and training, there were also a number of injuries sustained, as recalled by one of the female Wren drivers stationed at HMS Varble. She remembered in particular the casualties that she had to take to hospital when the crews returned from operations especially an unfortunate engine room artificer. The long sleeve of his submarine jersey had become caught in the revolving engine shaft aboard one of the X-craft, which took his arm with it. After the commanding officer had severed the few remaining shreds of skin with a dinner knife, he was rowed ashore, quite conscious by another crew member, and his arm followed in a cardboard box. This fine old shooting lodge, Arter Egg, on the shores of Loch Striven, was also taken over by the Navy in August 1942 and renamed Varble II. Like Varble I, it was a happy home of many of the 12th Fertilla personnel. This is a sectional drawing of an XE-class submarine, which was, as previously mentioned, modified for Far East operations. Whilst the X-Craft was designed for four men, they had the capacity to carry five for specific operations. A, B, C and D show the positions of various crew members. A was the position of the first lieutenant at hydroplanes, pump and main motor controls. B, the captain at the periscope. C, the ERA would be stationed here with steering controls and D, that's the position of the boat's diver in the wet and dry compartment. Pictured here are three XE craft alongside a jetty whilst preparing for operations. Unfortunately, we're not sure where this picture was taken. The X craft were designed to be towed to approximately 20 to 30 nautical miles off their operating area by a larger submarine, the mother submarine, whilst dived at about 40 feet. This was a considerably slow process, as owing to the strain placed on the towing rope, the submarines could only be towed at an average speed of 9 knots. Towing a submarine whilst both vessels were dived was an extremely hazardous operation, as the tow tended to pull the X-craft to the surface. To counteract this, the X-craft had to flood additional water into her forward trim tanks, However, if the tow parted, 
the crew then had to react quickly to pump the additional weight of water out, otherwise the submarine would take on a rapid bow-down angle and dive out of control. Unfortunately, a few submarines were lost when the tow parted, both in training and during operations. When conducting operations, the submarine was also allocated two crews, one for the towing part of the operation and another crew for the operation itself. This picture provides a good perspective of the size of the submarine against the height of crew members and, as you can see, they would not be able to stand upright when in the submarine. The crew therefore had to crawl or maintain a crouched position throughout an operation. Considering that the submarine was designed to remain dive for a maximum of 10 days, you can imagine the state of the crew if they had to spend that amount of time in the crouched position. It's a wonder they could actually walk when they return from an operation. As you can see, there is not much freeboard between the top of the main hatch and the surface of the sea when the submarine is transiting on the surface. So, what happened to the majority of X-Craft? If they survived the war, most of them were scrapped between 1950 and 1960. However, one X-Craft that conducted operations in World War II, and which was built by Marshals of Gainsborough, the X-24, has been preserved at the Royal Navy Submarine Museum at Gosport, Hampshire, and is the only intact X-Craft to survive. And here is the X-24 as she is today, in the Royal Navy Submarine Museum. She's still not complete, as when she was found in Portsmouth Dockyard, various bits of the submarine had disappeared because of pilfering by collectors of military memorabilia. In this photograph, you can see the fixed search periscope and the raised attack periscope. We would imagine that the search periscope, fixed in that position, was only used when the submarine was on the surface, transiting to the final dive position, before commencing an operation. The attack periscope, by its design, would be very difficult to see by an observer on a surface ship and was used while the submarine was dived at periscope depth. The X-Craft were powered by a London bus diesel engine and were apparently very reliable. The diesel engine could be run either on the surface or when at periscope depth by using a snort mast the diesel engine provided power for the batteries, which powered the main motor, which then turned the propulsion shaft containing the propeller. Here you can see the chart table, which has been converted into the only purpose-built bunk. The first seat for the executive officer for control of the pumping systems, and the second seat for the captain on the periscope. You can also see the round entrance hatch that gives access to the wet and dry compartment and is the area where the diver exited and re-entered the submarine. To do that, the entire compartment was flooded and, on his return, drained down once inside. The other area available for sleeping was on the deck boards in the forward compartment that covered the main battery. This was quite a precarious area in which to sleep, because if you were not careful, you could easily receive a shock from the battery if your arm inadvertently dropped through a gap in the battery boards and came into contact with the battery leads. This compartment also contained all of the food stores, which were mostly tinned. Crew members normally had a large meal at an appropriate time before making the final approach to the target as they were unsure as to when they would get time for another meal. Apart from tin food, typical stores included one black flag to make a Jolly Roger, fish scares, 300 paper plates, pillowcases, two toilet rolls, two hammock beds and a housewife, which is a naval sewing kit. Food was cooked on an electric double boiler, or glue pot, which together with an electric coffee pot made up the only two cooking appliances. We should also point out that there was only one plate for both the meat course and the pudding. 
One of the crew members' favourite meals was tomato soup, lamb's tongues with green peas and tin new potatoes. They were all heated together in one saucepan, which submariners called pot mess, and then there were loganberries and tin milk to follow. During an operation, most crew members took turns to sleep on the chart table bunk. As one got out, another crew member would take his place. This was called hot bunking and is still practiced today, particularly when carrying trainees. This is a photograph of an officer on the attack periscope and shows the cramped conditions on board the submarine. The details of the various operations conducted by the X-Craft is the subject of another presentation which we have yet to put together. However, this slide shows the titles of some of the operations conducted. During Operation Source, X-5 was lost, X-7 crew captured and X-10 retired through defects. However, the fate of X-8 and X-9 is unknown. The Marshals of Gainsborough X-24 conducted two successful operations in 1944. The first in April 1944 was designed to sink the floating dock at Laxivag within the Norwegian fjords and which the Germans were using to repair and maintain their U-boats. Whilst the attack was successful, the floating dock was not sunk. However, the crew did manage to sink an important German storeship, the Baron Fells. On the second attack in September 1944, the floating dock was successfully sunk, causing considerable disruption to U-boat operations in the Atlantic and North Sea. The X-Craft were designed for a maximum of 10 days dived. However, this was not dictated by the amount of fuel they could carry, but rather the maximum amount of food they could store and the maximum time you could feasibly keep a human encased within a cramped, damp, and very uncomfortable steel tube. The photograph you're now looking at shows the damage caused to the Baron Fell by X-24 during Operation Guidance in April 1944. John Britnell is seen here raising the Jolly Roger in recognition of a successful attack on return from the first X-24 operation. This is Vernon Ginger Coles, X-24's ERA, having just completed 19 hours continuously on watch during Operation Guidance. And this is a photograph of him today, at the tender age of 90 plus. An X-24 returning from the second operation, Operation Heckle, and flying a Jolly Roger with two bars. This time they completely demolished the German floating dock that the Germans used to maintain their submarines. Here you can see some of the other operations conducted by X-Craft. It's significant to note that not many people knew of the crucial role that the X-Craft played during the D-Day landings, which was codenamed Operation Gambit. What the X-Craft submarines during World War II achieved can be estimated from this list of awards, which includes 26 mentions in dispatches, commendations, for the operations they conducted. This list was also sent to Messrs Marshall by the flotilla captain with the following tribute. No man can achieve results if the weapons which he has to use fail him when the test comes. It was your responsibility to produce weapons that would not fail. I can well believe that for a firm to be faced with shipbuilding, and shipbuilding of such technical and specialised sort, was a most unexpected call on your resources. But I can truthfully say that the results you produced were magnificent. The officers and men of this flotilla who manned the submarines which were built by you never had the slightest reason to doubt the soundness and excellence of their craft. These submarines went out of marshals ready to take to the water. They were equipped down to the last detail, 
even to the making of the ship's crest. I was that which others did not wish to be. I went where others feared to go, and did what others failed to do. I asked nothing from those who gave nothing, and reluctantly accepted the thought of eternal loneliness should I fail. I have seen the face of terror, felt the stinging cold fear, and enjoyed the sweet taste of a moment's love. But most of all, I have lived times others would say were best forgotten. At least some day I will be able to say I was proud of what I was and always will be. One of the few, that happy few, that happy band of brothers.